Yo, yo, what up? It's Raphael with NBA Draft Junkies. I'm doing something a little bit different in this video. It's not a scouting report or a breakdown. It's different because, number one, I wanted to thank each and every person that has subscribed to my channel, that has commented, left messages, whether it was good or bad. And so I want to thank each and every person for that. Also, if, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. I'm trying to bring the best NBA draft content that, that I can. I, I, want, I, I literally want to be the best. So I'm actually recording this from Athens, Greece. And I've been traveling a lot. I've been traveling. I've been, I left the States in November and I haven't been home. I've been to Paris twice. I stayed in Barcelona for a month. I've been in Athens for a month. I went to Istanbul. And the reason I said all that is because I haven't been able to reply to a lot of the comments and messages and I don't want to be that guy that just you know guys are replying and asking me questions and I I never reply or it makes it seem like I ignored them and you know obviously the more the channel grows the more comments and the more difficult it is to reply to everyone so what I did was I just went through some comments or that I hadn't replied to a screenshot them and instead of just replying on YouTube, I'm going to reply right here in the video. If it's you, I'm not going to call your, your name out. I'm just going to just read the questions out. So this shouldn't take too long. So let's let's get started. And I haven't rehearsed these. I just saw it was a question. I screenshot it and then I'm just going to try to answer them to the best of my knowledge right right here live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you explain the AJ Griffin Butler comparison? All right, so the question is, can I explain why Duke freshman AJ Griffin is being compared to Jimmy Butler? I think one, just their body type, just the the six seven, six six, two hundred and twenty pounds. I mean, both are are physical. I think Griffin is probably a little bit more explosive which is funny because that was one of the concerns I had coming into the season. He doesn't necessarily play explosive. His game isn't built off of pure athleticism, but when he's in the open floor or when he has a runway, he does showcase his athleticism. But I think the Butler comparisons are both because of their size, they'll be able to play multiple positions. I think Griffin has the physical tools to be a Butler type defender. And sometimes being a great defender isn't all based off of physical tools, it's a mentality. But he does have that type of size and the ability to be able to create his own shot and punish teams for playing, defending him with a smaller, weaker guard. So I, I see the comparisons. Um, Butler doesn't shoot a lot of threes and Griffin is right now. I mean, he's a very efficient shooter from three, so I get why a person may say, why are they being compared to each other? But I think it's more so about physical attributes and some of the intangibles, but not necessarily about shooting threes because that is something that we've seen with Miami that Jimmy Butler is reluctant to shoot threes. And dating back to the NBA Finals, it was like he was refusing to shoot threes. But yeah, I think Griffin is definitely more confident in his shot from three. And then when he was coming back from injury, it seems like that's what he was really confident in. He wasn't like mentally prepared to play aggressive and attack the rim, but we've seen that over the last few games. So hopefully I answered that correctly. All right, the next question is, where is Trevor Kills at? And I'm just not as high on Trevor Kills as a lot of other people. I still think that he's riding the wave from the game at the very beginning of the season. Now, at, there was at one point he was really, really, really struggling to finish at the rim. And lately he's been able to get those numbers up. I think he's gonna be an NBA player. I don't necessarily know his role. I don't think that he's a really good shooter. I don't think he's gonna be a good finisher at the rim because he lacks the vertical pop. And when he gets there, he's able to bully his way there. I just have questions about how he'll finish and traffic versus length. I, I think defensively there is a role for him. I've seen the comparisons to Lou Dort. 
And I guess you can say this is similar to the Butler and AJ Griffin thing. The thing about Dort was he was an aggressive scorer at Arizona State. He was inefficient. He was just put his head down and he was a guy that looked to score every time. Oklahoma City somehow got him to buy into a role as a defender. And then now he's able to showcase what he can do on offense. And, you know, Dort is someone that outperformed his draft position or he basically, he wasn't even drafted. And so with Kills, I have him as a second round pick. If he ends up being like Lugans Dort, then he's gonna make me look wrong <laughs> or he'll make me wrong and he'll make, uh, he'll, he'll just be a prospect that I was wrong about because I don't have him as a first round pick. I've even seen some people have him as a lottery pick and I just, I just don't see it. All right, the next, this is not necessarily a question. It's a comment. Chet Holmgren and Poku would be the craziest twin towers. That would be the, the, the lightest front court since a young Hakeem and Ralph Sampson. Poku's been a disappointment to me, to be honest with you. He hasn't made the jump that I expected. Now he shows flashes. I know he's super young. And I mean, the talent is there. I mean, he is, a guy that has a, a unique skill set for his size. And it just seems like I was expecting him to make a bigger jump this year, and he really hasn't made that jump. But I mean, he's so young, he's so inexperienced, and I think that he has plenty of time to develop into this unique weapon. But yeah, him and, and, and Chet together would be pretty interesting there. I mean, they'd be really, really thin on, on the front line. It would be interesting to see them t play together. But then you can say the same thing about if Houston decides to draft Chet Holmgren if he's available and they still keep Christian Wood. And that was the same thoughts I had last year that if Houston would have taken Evan Mobley at number two, Mobley and Wood would have been a, a pretty thin front line. But Evan Mobley is looking like he's not really having too many issues adjusting to the NBA due to his lack of strength or whatever. But yeah, Poku and Chet would be very, very interesting. You'd have, like I said, a really thin but skilled front court. Where do you stand on Musa Diabate? Hopefully I pronounced his name correctly. I've watched this film. I haven't watched it in the last few weeks. I think that he is someone that needs to come back for another year. I think that he's definitely an NBA player. He has what it takes, but I just think that, you know, it's probably best for him to come back for another year. I don't know if he'll get drafted as of today. And it's interesting. I think that his fellow Frenchman, Ishmael Kamagate, has bypassed him. Uh, Diabate was the, the better prospect. He, he was considered the prospect that had the higher upside, but I think Kamagate has has passed him up. But yeah, I don't think Diabate would, would get drafted. As of today, he's not on my top 60, so I have him coming back to school. All right, the next one is, who? okay, this guy, he says, I, I had Michael Foster as a first round pick on Mach 1.0, and then I had him as a second round pick on the second Mach. He says, you are totally way off of Michael Foster Jr. Take his game is nowhere near the old NBA. In an interview, he said his G League coach had him playing that way for now, and that's his role on the team. He can shoot off the dribble, he can defend the perimeter, he can also pass. He's very versatile. We're from the same city. Uh, you know, a little bias there. I've been watching him for years. You can't sleep on him at all. He can literally do everything from the, from block shots to threes to defend your best player, name it. Well, one of the things that I said about, about Michael Foster and my last mock was that he kind of reminds me of Julius Randle. That is not a knock by any means, but Randle is a guy that Knicks fans didn't like his first year there. They loved him last year. Now they seem to be souring on him this year. Rando is someone that I saw when he was in high school. He's obviously a, a physical presence. He's a bruiser. He has skills. He has guard skills. He can handle the ball. He can shoot. There's a lot of things that Julius Rando does well. And I see some of that in Michael Foster. The problem I have with Foster is I don't think he can shoot efficiently. He's a capable shooter, but he has a kind of a funky release in my opinion. And of course he's young, so he can grow and develop into a shooter, but I don't think he's an efficient shooter right now. I think that 
he does a lot of things. He, he can do a lot of things, but I don't know if there's anything that he does well outside of rebound and score around the basket, which is totally fine. I think that if he stuck to that, it would probably help him out, but I think he can get caught up in trying to showcase all of his skills and it kind of hurts him. Now, don't take this the wrong way. I felt like that was Thomas Robinson's problem. I think Thomas Robinson and Tristan Thompson are very similar. I felt like Thompson accepted his role as a rebounder and defender while Thomas Robinson was trying to show his guard skills, was trying to isolate, trying to put the ball on the floor. Even though he could do it, I don't think that was best for him long term as far as his role in the NBA. And I mean, you can see the difference. Tristan Thompson, I mean, he's made hundreds of millions of dollars and Thomas Robinson is out of the league. I don't want Foster to fall into that category because in the NBA, it's like, yes, they, they give you a role. And there are some guys that are more talented than the role that they're given, but they understand like, if I want to continue to be a rotational player or a starter, I'm going to have to accept this role. While there are guys that won't accept the role and they end up playing over in Europe because their game is only suited to play a certain way. So I kind of went on a tangent there, but I think Foster does have the skill set to be very versatile. The problem is sometimes I think he settles for too many jumpers and he kind of plays a little bit out of control when he's trying to make plays off the dribble. And I think that's why his draft stock is all over the place. Question: I like your list, but you have too many international players, very few international players, especially second round picks, make any impact in the NBA. Very few second round picks make impact in the NBA. Like if you go through the past 10 drafts, right? You look at guys that were drafted in the second round and it is a bunch of where are they now? So I don't think it has anything to do with guys being international. Yes, there's been successful second round picks that are international players. Nikola Jokic, for example, uh, Manu Ginobili. And then there are guys that are from the States that were second round picks that were successful and had long careers. But for the most case, very few second round picks make an impact. You can even look at the first round of drafts and you can go back five years from today and you can see there's probably five guys out of the 2016 draft that are out of the NBA right now that were first round picks. So, I mean, I know there's a international bias and I know that some people just aren't high on international prospects. And so when an international prospect doesn't turn out, it you know, they're all lumped into one category, which I, I don't think is fair. But to answer your question, or to answer your statement, very few second round picks make an impact. So I don't think it has anything to do with their nationality. Same guy says, way too high on Jaden Hardy. He's a second round prospect. Um, I, I had Jaden Hardy as a lottery pick. I don't think I'm as high on Jaden Hardy as a lot of other people. He's definitely someone that can score, put the ball in the basket. His efficiency has been very, very concerning. Efficiency or lack thereof efficiency. Um, you know, he was a guy that coming into the season, some people thought that he was going to be just as good as Jalen Green. They didn't think he had the athleticism as Jalen Green, but they thought there was some potential for him to play point guard or be a lead guard. I haven't seen it, but to be fair to him, he's had to share ball handling responsibilities. And he is averaging about three assists per game. So maybe it is there. But I can see why somebody wouldn't be high on Jaden Hardy simply because he's he's put up scoring numbers, but they've been really, really inefficient. And his shot selection is really, really questionable. And then some people have concerns about his athleticism, which I think it's fine. I mean, he's not Jalen Green, but I think he is a guy that he has enough to, I mean, he has the athleticism to get to his spots and, and get his shot off. He's just... I mean, it's a big adjustment for him, and I think that's why the efficiency is so off right now, but I don't think that he slides to the second round. All right, here's a comment about Chet Holmgren. He says, I see him getting at least one coach fired. He'll be in the third year of his rookie contract before he's physically able to contribute to winning. With that said, I would draft him at four. I would take Bancaro, 
Smith Jr. and now Jaden Ivey over him. And I can't say that you're wrong. I mean, I I can respect the, the opinion there that you think that Jaden Ivey is better than Chet. And I mean, I think any time you're selecting a top four, there's a chance that the coach that was there your rookie year won't be there. I don't think Chet would get him fired. I think people understand that he's going to take some time to fill out and, and, and get stronger. But I just think that his defensive impact is going to, I mean, it could be game changing. I mean, it could be franchise changing, I should say. I'm high on Chet. I still have him at number two on my last mock. I had to think about that because I haven't done three yet, but I mean, the picks one, two, and three are can be fluid. Matter of fact, I've even seen some people have Jaden Ivey going number two. I think what Chad Ford did, I don't know if it was his big board or his personal mock that Bancaro fell to number four. Very interesting, but we still have a few months left before this whole process really kicks in. I, I don't really see anything that you said that was off the mark there uh, as far as Chet. I don't think Chet would get a coach fired, but I wouldn't be shocked to see the coach that is there as his during his rookie season not be there. That's just the NBA. All right, the next comment. Okay, what prospects are you watching for the Blazers right now? I am a Blazers fan. Oh, man, I just think if you're Portland, man, you just, just at, at this point... I want them to keep Dame. I want them to keep CJ. I love what I'm seeing out of Ant Simons. I like Nurk. At this point, I think it's a lost season, even though the play-in kind of changes things. It's a lost season. Let's just be bad. Hope that we can strike out, or not strike out, but strike gold in the lottery. I would love to see Ben Carroll. I mean, he's a Pacific Northwest guy. Would love to see him in Portland. Chet. Another Pacific Northwest guy, based off of where he went to school, would, wouldn't mind seeing him in Portland. I don't know about the Jaden Ivey fit. Jabari Smith, obviously, would, would be a good fit. I don't want them to make any trades right now. I would say, be bad this year. Then, if you're going to be bad this year, let's see where we can land in the lottery. If we can get into the top three, then it's a win. Other than that, prospects that I think would be good for Portland. Man, I think Portland could use, an, I mean, size, size on the wing. Um, I mean, I think like Kendall Brown would be a good fit, but I don't know if he matches the timeline for Dame and CJ because they're both over 30. But he is the type of player that Portland has needed in the past athleticism and another passer, another guy that can make plays for others. I think Portland over the last few years just haven't had enough guys that can pass. Nance is, you know, improving it somewhat this year, but I just think this is a lost season. My best case scenario is the Blazers are bad. Dame sits out the year and we get a top three pick. If we get a top three pick, then, you know, next year should be, should be a good situation for Portland, but you got to stay healthy. Injuries have been killing the Blazers over the past two years. All right, here's one. Pistons fan here with the draft coming, and it's pretty apparent the Pistons will have a top three pick again. I'm interested to know what guy, Chet, Jabari, or Paolo, should the Pistons target? Obviously, the Pistons are at a stage in its rebuild where acquiring talent over fit should be a priority. But I feel the Pistons should entertain certain fits as it relates to Cade Cunningham. I, I agree. I think Cade is the guy. I shouldn't say I think. I know Cade is the guy. I think Ben Carroll would be a really good fit. That would be my first choice. Um, Jabari would also be a good fit. I mean, you'd have a really nice pick and pop combination there. Same with Chet. Chet would provide, provide some defense. I don't think you can go wrong there. But I did hear something that was pretty interesting. Uh, Troy Weaver is a guy that is really high on athleticism. And he is the guy that is getting a lot of credit for selecting Westbrook. And so I, I did hear that he could be a Jaden Ivey type of guy, which means the Killian Hayes experience would be over. And Detroit is a team that is probably one of the least athletic teams in the league as far as just athletes and so Jaden Ivey would definitely improve their athleticism there the question is what do you do with Killian I, I saw some um, tweet that said he's like the worst shooter in the NBA from different spots on the floor 
And I think Cade is a natural primary ball handler. And I think Killian is best with the ball in his hands because he's not an efficient shooter right now. And I mean, I just think it's too young to give up on, to break them up. But, I, you know, if, if I'm Detroit, any of those top three would, would be a good fit. Outside of that, I don't know. It depends on what they do with, with Grant. If they trade Grant for Patrick Williams or, I mean, I think they can get some young pieces or picks for him. They could end up with multiple picks. Then they could end up uh, pretty, you know, <laughs> like Orlando with, with a lot of young guys. But I would go with Ben Carroll. He would be my top choice for the Pistons if they're in that situation, if they're in position to draft him. Who should the Bulls target? That's a, a pretty good question. I mean, I think Chicago is is good at, at the point guard position. Actually good in the backcourt. They have a lot of depth there between Caruso to Ayo, who's played very well. He's outplayed his draft position and, you know, this time that he was able to play. Um, Lonzo, he's hurt right now. Kobe White, he's having a... a he He's not the player that I saw the second half of his, his rookie year. His name is in trade room, so I don't think they need a guard. You just got to take uh, the, the best player available, and if it's someone that that is young and really talented, then you can swing for the fences, and I would say a guy like Abu Baji. High risk, high reward guy, and if the, the Bulls' new management is big on developing, then he could be a real winner for them and you know, could kind of work his way up and and then end up being something special on the defensive end. That's who I would go with. I mean, I think Chicago's in position where they can swing for the fences because they have they have plenty of depth, in, in my opinion. How do you feel about Trevian, Trevion Williams from Purdue? I like him a lot. I think that he's a, a guy that if he was born in a different era, he'd be a top 10 pick. He's like this old school, wide body, physical bruiser. He has good touch around the rim. His passing, I think, is what's going to really help him out. Um, I mean, he's a, a he's a a really good passer. Period. Not based off of him being a center. I think that his feel for the game as a passer is. I mean, I think it's it's probably one of the. I mean, I think he's the best passing center in this draft. Unless you think that Chet is a center, you think that Paolo is going to be a small ball five. But yeah, I mean, I, I like Williams. I I have him as a second round pick on my board, but he is someone that I can see sliding into late first round. And if he slides into the late first round, he could end up on a, a, a really good team and, and carve out a role as a rookie. But I, I like him. I mean, I know there's a debate if, if he's even the best center on his team at Purdue. I'm going with Williams. All right, it's the last question. Off topic, how do you feel about Khalifa Jop as a prospect personally? He intrigues me quite a bit, big and strong, fairly athletic, decent laterally, and just all around disruptive defender. Also, his mid-range shot is something that really gets my hopes up for him. Hitting a few threes in the under-19 games was something nice to see. Would love him on my Thunder as a pick-and-roll partner with Josh and, and SGA, but I want to hear your thoughts on him. I like Jop, too. Um, Jop and Baji, who I just mentioned, they were teammates. And I remember my first time seeing both of them play at the under 19s, and it was in 2019. But they were really young. I want to say they were like 16, 16 years old at the time. And I thought both guys were going to be NBA players. I didn't think that they complemented each other because they're both fives. And they both had to play together, even though they played the same position and there wasn't a lot of spacing. At the time, I thought Baji was going to be a top five pick just because he's 7'1", like 7'8", 7'9", wingspan, probably has a 40-inch vert. I mean, he's just a phenomenal athlete. For whatever reasons, his development hasn't progressed the way I was hoping it would. And there are a lot of people that think Jop is now the better prospect. And I wouldn't be totally surprised if Baji goes undrafted and Jop is a second round pick. But I, I, I agree. I, I see like he shows some flashes of touch. If he goes to the Thunder, he could be their starting center as, as a rookie. I know that right now, Robinson Earl, I mean, I think he's starting. I, I have no idea with all the roster changes and stuff going on. But I think if Jop goes to Oklahoma City, I think that would be a good fit. Actually, if I'm like his agent and 
he's falling to the second round, I may even suggest like, you know, I call it the Austin Reeves route. Don't draft me, put me in a position where I can get a two-way contract with the team that I think is the best fit. And I think Oklahoma City would be a really, really good fit. Well, that wraps it up. It's actually a little longer than I thought. Uh, I'm probably gonna start doing this maybe like once a week or once every two weeks. Like I said, I've been traveling. That's why the background looks different. I am currently in Athens, Greece. I've been all over. Um, there's a, a tournament later on this weekend. It's not in Budapest. It's right outside of Budapest, Hungary. It's like a bunch of prospects that are born in like 2006. I'm considering going there. And then I need to check out Italy. Italy has quite a few prospects. So I'll be on the move. My Barlow's Abroad episode two, I should be dropping that pretty soon. But yeah, thank you for everybody that, like I said, that has left me comments, that has subscribed. Again, I want to answer as many questions or reply to as many comments as possible. This is probably a little bit easier for me. It's fun, more fun than typing it out. But if you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Hit the like notification bell button. I'm going to have a lot of work for you. Check out the website, nbadraftjunkies.com. My goal is 250 player profiles between now and the draft. Not all of them are going to be guys for this particular draft class. I'm even digging into guys that probably aren't going to be drafted to like 2025. 20, some, some young teenagers who can't even drive yet. So thanks for listening. It's Raphael, NBA Draft Junkies, and I'm out.